All right, so sacred families, this is lesson number four in the series. This, uh, this particular lesson is entitled Parenting 101 Part One, because for parenting, uh, we, we can't do it all in one lesson, not even two lessons, but we'll, we'll try. Uh, so far in our sessions, we've uh, talked about marriage, uh, which is the basis of the sacred family. And I've shown that a marriage, which is based on God's design in the Bible, is the foundation for building a sacred or a family devoted to God. The whole idea behind this is that a sacred family is a family not that's just happy or a family that's united or a family that's well off, but a sacred family is a family that is consciously devoted to God and His, um, and His service. Uh, then in the last couple of sessions, we talked about uh, the ways that partners in a marriage can cultivate a kind of love that will last a lifetime because um, uh, in that lesson I mentioned the idea that the, the purpose of marriage, of our marriage, is to love one another and to be able to do so for a lifetime. It's, you know, it's kind of easy to love each other for a year or two. You know, it's new, it's great, it's exciting, but the, the trick is to uh, have love for life because marriage is for life. And I mentioned the, the thought that if God created marriage to be something that is experienced over a lifetime, well then He's also given us the tools and the capabilities of loving one another for a lifetime, which makes that marriage uh, fulfilling and uh, joyful. And to that thought we added that the, the currency of love Okay. The way we deal with love, the way we increase love and improve love is through communication. Because everything we do in marriage is through communication of one kind or another. And if we want to improve love, the place to begin is to improve communication. And communication that is honest and clear and complete is the kind of communication that builds love in our marriage. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about marriage, how to establish it, make it grow. Today we're going to talk about children and raising children in a family. First, a quote. If it was going to be easy to raise kids, it would never have started with something called labor. Anonymous. Next, a question for all parents. And you'll have to answer this in your, in your mind. Why did you decide to have children? I've done this when we have a kind of an open session. We're not necessarily filming, so we have time to kind of do the back and forth and ask people, why did you have children? And some people, they kind of think about that for a while. Before they write something down, they give it a long thought. You know? And some of the reasons that I've seen in the past, uh, well, it just happened, okay? Or we wanted a family, well, that's a legitimate reason. Um, uh, well, the bio clock was ticking. <laughs> you know, I was getting older and we didn't have any children and we figure it's now or never. Or I love children, I just love children, I've always loved children and I thought, well, having children of our own, I mean, you know, no downside. Also, I wanted to be a parent. I, I, I saw my parents and I, I, I also wanted to be a parent. And then of course the most common reason for uh, wanting children is I did not enjoy sleep. So, right, think about that one for a minute. All right. So all of these reasons are noble and true, but the one reason to have children that is the most concrete and able to see us through all the challenges of parenthood is this. God commands us to have children. I know that sounds old fashioned. Oh, that's in the Old Testament. But that command has not kind of you know, been superseded by any other uh, command. Not only are we to continue to multiply until Jesus returns, but the Bible also says that we are to raise spiritually sensitive children who will know God and know His will. A couple of passages here. In Psalm 78, the writer says, Listen, O my people, to my instruction. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, 
which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us, we will not conceal them from their children, but tell to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and His strength and His wondrous works that He has done. For He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which He commanded our fathers, that they should teach them to their children, that the generation to come might know, even the children yet to be born, that they may raise and tell them to their children, that they should put their confidence in God and not forget the works of God, but keep His commandments and not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that did not prepare its heart and whose spirit was not faithful to God. In context, the writer here is saying, uh, we need to tell our children about God and the good things that God has done. In other words, we need to train our children in godly living and godly understanding. And he repeats this idea. We need to tell not only our children, but we need to do it in such a way that our children tell it to their children. You know, he mentions those not even born yet. You need to be prepared. You know, the purpose of having those children is so that they will know and understand uh, who God is. And then another passage, perhaps a little more familiar in 2 Timothy 3, Paul is saying to the young preacher Timothy, you, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them. And uh, you know, that part, knowing from whom you have learned them, Timothy learned the things of God from his mother and from his grandfather, uh, grandmother because his father was a Gentile. Father was not a a, a believer in God. So he says, um, knowing from whom you have learned them and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Here uh, Paul is saying to Timothy, you know, he's a good example. He says, I know that the reason that you are a person of faith now and you're the man you are, you're the Christian man you are, is that because from a very early age, your mother and your grandmother trained you and taught you and helped you to memorize scripture so that you would be ready for salvation when the time came. Okay. So two passages that clearly indicate uh, the spiritual, of course, you know, we have to dress them and feed them and educate them and train them and of course that, that all comes with it. Uh, but the primary purpose is to train them in the things of God, to prepare them for the things of God. Uh, what's the point if uh, uh, your kid uh, uh, makes it to the NFL and becomes the quarterback that uh, wins the Super Bowl but has no knowledge of God and when he dies, that's it, it's all over, it's done. I mean, what was the point of all of that? Okay. And I'm not saying one is mutually exclusive to the other. I mean, if you have a, if you have a child that has a tremendous talent, by all means, you know, cultivate it, develop it. That doesn't mean we have to ignore also that child's spiritual development. That's very important. That's going to last his or her entire lifetime. So it helps us to have the right focus as parents if we understand that having kids is not just about us. And it's not about how we feel, and it's not about what we want. Having children is about God because He specifically has called on us to bear and raise children for His glory, not our glory. Interesting book entitled Sacred Parenting. Author Gary Thomas reminds parents that when they realize this fact, that they're raising children and the primary purpose of raising children is to bring them to God, when they realize this fact, the trials and sacrifices of parenting are more easily borne. You don't keep saying to yourself, why am I doing this? Why, you know, this is so too hard. You know, why should I even try? You know, well, there's a reason why you're trying. There's a reason why you're not going to give up. It's no longer how my children make me feel. I feel proud of them, or I feel ashamed of them, or I'm worried about them but rather how faithful have I been in my duty to God as a parent? That's the key question. How have I done that job? You know, to pin our hopes and our dreams on an immature, sinful human being, which is what every child essentially is, is not a recipe for happiness. 
I mean, no wonder parents become discouraged and disillusioned when children don't fulfill their potential. We expect them to be better than us. I've not met a parent yet who has said, well, you know, I did pretty good in life and uh, I hope my child doesn't do as well as I because you know, I, I always want to be the best one in my family. Of course not. We're always want, no matter how, how successful we are, quote, in life, we always want our children to do better than us. Better education, more success, more happy, whatever it is, we want them to do better. That's fine. When we accept that the reason and work of parenting is to breathe the life of God into our children and family is the divine framework where this is done, several things happen. First of all, we gain an overall vision of our task as parents that helps us persevere in this lifetime process. I mean, we know what our task really is as parents. It's not so that my child becomes, I don't know, a movie star or a sports hero or, or, or a doctor or a lawyer. Again, all those things are fine if they, if they have the skills and you have the money to give them the education, that's fine. But that's not my primary task. That's not my primary task. That's not where my satisfaction or happiness is going to come from. I know a lot of parents whose children are successful, but they're miserable. The parents are. Secondly, when we know this, we save ourselves from the performance anxiety that comes from relying on our children to provide us with self-affirmation through their accomplishments. I repeat that, very important. When we know what our main job is, breathing the life of God into our children, when we know that, then we don't get the anxiety or performance anxiety that comes from relying on our children to provide for us self-affirmation through their accomplishments. You know, a parent who's devastated because their kid came in second in the gymnastic contest, that's not a good thing. <laughs> that's not a good thing. If that's where you're going to get your affirmation, if that's where you're going to get your, yeah, man, I'm feeling great, my kid won, my kid's first, my kid did this, you're in for a hard, hard life and lots of disappointment. Obeying God and parenting godly children produces the esteem and the encouragement that we need as parents, regardless of how many trophies the kids collect or not in their various activities. You know, if we're relying on our kids to feel good, that's a lot of pressure for them, and it's a setup for disappointment for us. How many kids have, have, have you been to Little League or have you been to these things where parents are like, they're going nuts, they're out of their minds, they're arguing, they're having a fight with the referee or the, the umpire, whoever it is, you know? Do, do we realize how much, how much pressure that puts on, on our children? I mean, if you could read their mind, you know, the kid is saying, yeah, that's my dad over there. You know. I'm not claiming him. <laughs> also, breathing the life of God into our children also affords us the greatest opportunity for future reward. Ask any grandparent whose children and grandchildren are faithful Christians. Yeah. You know. Now I understand that there are many aspects and issues concerning the parenting experience, and we're not going to talk about because lack of time. You know, we can talk about discipline, eating habits, bedwetting, sibling rivalry, preparing for adolescence, but we will talk about preparing for adolescence, uh, touch on that in a lesson or two. But I'm doing this particular lesson called Parenting 101 because it's the foundation upon which these other issues will be played out. For now, let's get into the kind of the nuts and bolts of how exactly do we go about breathing the life of God into our children. Start with a scripture here, Genesis 2, 7. Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. Another scripture and then I'll make a point. 
here in John 20, and when he, meaning Jesus, when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side. The disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Now what, what is common to these two passages here? Well, in both these instances, we witness first Adam and then the apostles receiving the life of God in them. Adam received the spirit or the image or the likeness of God which separated him from other forms of life. In other words, there were other forms of life, but then God created man and breathed God's life into him, God's image into him, and made Adam different than all of the other animals. Yes, he walked and he ate of the earth and he breathed oxygen and air and all that stuff, but he was not like the other animals. He is in the image of God. And how did he become like that? God breathed life into him, okay? And then the apostles, they received the Holy Spirit himself at this point. If you ever wondered, when did the Holy Spirit receive the, uh, excuse me, when did the apostles receive the Holy Spirit? We know in Acts 2.38, people repent, they're baptized, their sins are forgiven, they receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. But when did the apostles receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit? They weren't baptized over again. They were baptized in John's baptism. Well, this is where, in John 20.20, 20, Jesus breathed the Spirit of God into them. For what reason? This would separate them from those who did not have the Spirit, did not have eternal life. Okay, here's my point. When I talk about breathing the life of God into our children, I'm referring to the same kind of action that we perform on our children. The same thing that God did for Adam, for Adam and the same thing that Jesus did for the apostles, we do for our children. Not in a miraculous way, however. The life of God that is within us as Christian parents will be breathed into our children in order to separate them from those who do not have the life of God within them. William Gaultier, an author, in an article about, spiritual, about the spiritual development of children says the following. He says, I believe that the primary purpose of Christian parenting is discipleship, inviting my children into my walk with Jesus, investing in them the life of God that I've come to experience so that they grow into being new creatures in Christ. And he's, you know, making a point from 2 Corinthians 5.17. He also mentions four elements that are necessary in order to breathe life, the life of God, into our children. And here's the first. First of all, he says, breathe love into them. Breathe love into them. Loving your children as God loves you. Now the, the practical aspect of this idea is found in 2 Corinthians. He says, uh, here for this third time I am ready to come to you and I will not be a burden to you for I do not seek what is yours but you. For children are not responsible to save up for their parents but parents for their children. So Paul is talking about parenting. He sees himself as a parent if you wish of these new Christians here in Corinthians. The parenting relationship should be focused on the parent providing for the child's need, not the reverse. Children are not the ones responsible for our emotional needs. Oh, that is so important. Children are not responsible for our emotional needs. I've seen this, especially in families you know, where there's a single mom or a single dad, for whatever reason, divorce, death, whatever, and all of a sudden the child takes on some kind of emotional responsibility for mom's you know, emotional well-being. In other words, we start talking to our children as if they're adults as if they're adults, they're eight, they're nine, they're 11. We're talking to them as if they're adults. We're, we're giving them a platform you know, as if they're adults. And that's okay because if they're bright and they're willing, you know, let, oh, we're talking real talk here with mommy, we're daddy. The problem we don't realize, they're way too young 
to support the emotional weight of our issues. Because if you talk to them like they're equal, like they're adults, right? They're going to begin thinking that they're responsible for adult things. They're going to start thinking that they're actually responsible for your happiness. If you're down, when that single mom gets depressed, who do you think feels responsible? Yeah, well, the 13-year-old daughter, because I mean, they're having coffee together and they're talking, there's just us girls. Yeah, that's way too much weight for a child. They're the children. We're the adults. I mean, it's okay to speak to them not as babies. You know, if your kid's 13 years old, you don't go, come here, little pookie poo. You know, I mean, he's not a baby. She's not a baby. But we have to remember age appropriate communication. Age appropriate communication. I remember, I, I think it was Paul, I'm not sure, but one of our kids one time called me by my name. I thought, yeah, you must have seen that at somebody's house. That was pretty cool. His little buddy's dad, his name was John, and his little buddy said, hey John, what's going on? Yeah, I finished school. Okay, John, I'm taking off here with whoever. And they thought that was pretty cool, and they came home, you know, hey Mike. <laughs> that was the end of that. <laughs> that was the end of that experiment. <laughs> I'm the parent, you're the child. You may one day become an adult, great, great, but I'm still always going to be the parent. I'm never giving up that role, I can't. Okay? So it is God in His love who provides for us in His love as we do for our children in our love. And we don't only provide for them the physical things that they need, obviously, food and clothing, education, but also we provide for them emotional protection and spiritual training. We never forget that they are children. They're on the receiving end. We're on the giving end. Understanding this helps neutralize the bitterness often expressed by parents who are tired of the demands of parenthood. You know, I've heard some parents you know, say, even myself at times, you know, well, I didn't get that when I was a kid. When I was a kid, we didn't have TVs. You, know, you got a TV in your room. I didn't, we didn't even have TV in the house. When I was a kid, you know, I wasn't coddled. When I was a kid, yeah, 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 blah, 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 you know, all this kind of stuff. And that kind of talk usually usually comes from a kind of resentment that the parent has for their own children. Because parenting is hard work and often thankless work. You're giving, you're taking care, you're you know, doing this and that, and you're not getting a whole lot back. And so that resentment starts to bubble up. If you yourself have not had a good childhood, if your mom and dad you know, just didn't treat you right, and it happens, if you had a difficult childhood, if you were poor, if you were abused, whatever, you resent it sometimes if your children are getting for free. And the hard part is they don't even know what they're getting, right? <laughs> they don't even realize what they have. If you never lived in a house, ever, you know, like my mother, for example. She never lived in a house. She lived in an apartment her whole life. She's her whole life, 85 years, she lived in apartments all the time. Could never afford to buy her own home. Never had a car. So I had a house and I had, what, two cars. You know, I didn't understand what it is that I had in comparison to her. I, I didn't get it. I didn't get it. So I couldn't relate to her. The thing we have to remember when these things come up is just because our parents may not have met our needs does not justify us making the same mistake with our own children. I didn't get it, so why should you? My father never sat down and had a conversation with me. My father never sat down and took me out and had dinner just with me. My dad never came to my ball games, so you know, suck it up. <laughs> not exactly. Not exactly breathing love into your childhood. Children learn love from observation 
and experience. And they make the connection that God is love from the example of their parents. You know, mommy is love or dad is love. Children who are not loved by their parents have a hard time perceiving God's love. I mean, children who haven't received love from their parents have a hard time just giving love. They have a hard time expressing love. They don't have a lot of tools in the toolbox to express love because it was never expressed to them. So how, you know, they don't know how to be a loving mom or dad because their mom and dad was not a very loving person. They're making, a, they're making an effort at it. But even worse than that, someone who has not received love and not giving love to their child, their child doesn't understand how God is love because they, if I can't see it in the, somebody who is my parent, how am I going to see it in someone that I can't even see? <laughs> you know, not even visible. Now, parental love is not just theoretical, it's very practical, even mundane at times. For example, what is parental love? Well, meeting basic physical needs, of course, physical affection, listening, watching. Remember, every time the child saying to you, watch me, daddy, watch me, what he's saying or she's saying is, love me, daddy. Love me, mommy. After the hundredth time it gets annoying, I, I understand that, but realize what that is. Verbalizing affirmation, you know, boy, good girl. And I mean, we could kind of you know, drill down on that thing. Legitimate attaboy. Legitimate attaboy. You ate the food that's in front of you. You don't get a trophy for that. <laughs> you should be thankful for that. <laughs> you go to bed at the time that you're supposed to go to bed. You don't get a certificate of accomplishment for that. Now you help your little brother finish his peas by saying, watch, look, they're good. You eat your peas. Okay, that's an attaboy. The reason that I say that is too many fake attaboys, too many artificial trophies, then the child is expecting you know, a trophy for everything they are supposed to do. Again, you don't get a trophy for doing what you're supposed to do. The reward for obeying is the fact that you have obeyed and you remain in the good graces of your parents and then your teachers and then your boss and then your supervisor and then you know, your constituents if you're the president. You know, that's the reward you're getting. Play at their level, not them watching you play. Sometimes parents, you know, they think, yeah, I'm going to take the kids with me, you know, and uh, they're going to have a good time. And, and what are you doing? Well, you're monkeying around with your car. You're, you're, you're changing your oil or something, you know, and the kid's sitting there watching you. Well, we had a good afternoon. Eh? Didn't we have a good afternoon? We went out and we played with daddy's car. <laughs> yeah, that's not playing at their level. <laughs> of course, offering comfort, Discipline when necessary, advice, gifts, favors, specials, sure, specials. Curfews at nine o'clock, the movie's, you know, whoa, 40 more minutes to go and it's already nine o'clock. Mom, what, what do we do now? Dad, ah, it's a special, come on. We've had a great day, let's finish the movie. Ah, oh, special, thank you. Yeah, that says I love you, we make specials. There's a lot more that can be said about love. But let me just emphasize two things about breathing God's love into your children and we'll shut it out for today. We're not going to get through all of this. The worksheet that you've got, fear not, that's for two lessons. We're going to finish this up next week. The only person who knew that was Celestia. All right, two things we need to know about loving. First of all, it takes time. It takes time to love children. Busyness is the enemy of love because love takes lots of time. No shortcuts. This business about quality time, that's the biggest lie, okay? Lots of time, actually lots of quality time is what's, what is necessary. Most families in our hectic, overly scheduled lives think that doing lots of things together is the same thing as being together. No, 
We're not human doings, we're human beings. Being together is important, not just doing stuff. Better sitting around the house with the main activity just being together than a jam-packed day watching each other scurry from one activity to another. So your dad's talking to the other dads and other adults while you're playing soccer and then the thing, it's over. Okay, come on, everybody can I get in the car? You know, we got to go to Susie's ballet lesson. And then, and then we're talking to the other parent while Susie's doing her ballet. And then, well, we got to go pick up stuff at the store. They're going to come home. Ooh, didn't we have fun today? We had a lot of activities today. <laughs> fun for who? Together how? And taking the one-on-one -on -one time with each child and the together time with the whole family to cultivate loving relationships, this is going to cost you something. It's going to cost, the, it's going to cost you in the speed of your career. It's going to cost you in the rate of getting all your projects done. Why is it that the kids are always last in the things to do list? It's going to cost your standing in Little League or whatever. But this is the choice that you make when you have children. Less time for me and my singular interests, more time to love and create love in my children. I've told my children, our children, you only have children for a small window part of your life. I mean that they're with you, we mentioned that already. But you have a long time afterwards to regret the mistakes that you make or the things that you've neglected. You know, they're with you for 20 years, but you, know, you, can, you can kind of scratch your head and feel bad about things you should have done ought to, you know, for another 40 years after they're gone. Now there's a payoff in this love investment and it usually comes in the form of spending less time dealing with the fallout caused by children who are acting out in destructive ways. Why? Because they're hungry for love. And so investing in them when they're young is important because it's going to cost you less when they're older. Number two, show your child how to express his or her love to God. Children soon learn to return their parents' love by being obedient and helpful. <laughs> Jesus, God says, if you love me, you'll obey me. Isn't that what he says? Isn't that how we test, how he tests our love? If you love me, he says, you'll obey my commandments. Well, if that's good enough for God, why shouldn't that be good enough for us? If you love me, Junior, you will obey me. Unfortunately, in our society, our competitive society, if you love me, you'll succeed. <laughs> if you love me, you'll be better than the others. If you love me, you know, you'll, you'll excel at something because your love will be shown to me by your success and then your success will then shine upon me and make me feel good. No, 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 no. If you love me, if you want to show that you love me, then you'll obey me. Everything else is gravy. Everything else is gravy. This exchange here teaches them the joy shared love which they will need in order to build healthy relationships in the future. If you can't obey your parents, right, then you can't obey the rules that help a marriage succeed. Because obedience is like a muscle, you know, it's a spiritual muscle. If you never develop the obedience muscle that your parents are responsible for training you in, how are you, going to, how are you going to maintain the obedience to the rules of marriage? To be faithful, to be kind, to be loving, not to be self-centered, not to be selfish, and so on and so forth. How are you going to do that if you can't even obey your mom or dad in the simple things? As parents, we should add the dimension of prayer to our child's life and help them see this as a genuine expression of love. If a child says to you, why do we pray? Mom, why do we pray before meals? Or why, why do we pray at night? The answer to that, because we love God. It's our way of saying to God, I love you. 
How do I know that? Because God has told us in His, in His word. Pray always, Paul says, right? So we think sometimes it's just cute you know, to see young ones bow their heads and clasp their hands, and it is cute to see that, little three-year-old, four-year-old you know, saying the prayer. But be careful not to transform what can be the beginning of their spiritual communication and expression of love towards God into some kind of children's theater where the child is performing or on display. It's like we're over at grandma's or Uncle Joe's, you know, oh, let's get a little Jimmy to pray. Watch this. Watch. Oh, it's going to be so cute. Mm -mm. No, there's no cute for praying. It is cute you know, at the beginning, but that's not the purpose of it. Teach them why and when and what and who prayer is about by modeling it and allowing them to participate meaningfully themselves. Yes, of course, for meals before or after or before a long trip in the car. That was one of our traditions in our family before we left on a long trip in the car. Everybody pack, everybody in the car, we got all the suitcases, okay, we're good. Okay, let's just stop a minute before we you know, put it in drive. Let's have a prayer and we'd have a prayer and say, have a safe trip and everybody enjoy themselves and so on and so forth and then okay, let's go. That's a great, that's a great teaching moment. Pray during a celebration or happy occasion or when making decisions, whatever. So teaching our children early to express their love to God in prayer will set into motion the spiritual life and attitudes that you hope that they're going to develop later in life. Okay, so that's just the first part. We're going to do part two on this sheet here uh, next time. I didn't want to try to cram everything.